Please join me in welcoming Ken Gormley, Barbara Perry, Ken Starr, and Michael Gerhardt. Thank you, John. Enjoy. You're just not enthusiastic enough. Very enthusiastic. Have fun. Well, thank you, Jeff, uh, for that introduction. Um, it's always a great privilege and wonderful opportunity to be here with all of you. Uh, I am Mike Gerhardt, again, a scholar in residence here at the National Constitution Center. Um, and it's my, also my distinct privilege and pleasure to have been able to participate in this book. Uh, Jeff has given us uh, the wonderful introduction, so I'm going to jump right in and get us started in a remarkable conversation about a book that literally covers all the presidents of the United States and their constitutional activities. That's a, the question might be, how could that be possible to do that in all a single book? We actually have the person here who can answer that, <laughs> himself about to become a president, uh, Ken Gormley, who will tell us about his experiences in putting this together, sort of what got you interested in this project and what did you think were the biggest challenges in doing it? Well, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. This is just such a fabulous place to talk about this book. Uh, I've taught constitutional law for 30 years or so. And one of the things, I've, I've written some books about great moments in presidential history and done big programs on them. But one of the things that has really always struck me is that typically books about the presidency are in lumps dealing with, you know, uh, war-making powers or, war, you know, wartime powers, domestic powers. They're in big subjects. But the more you see about it, uh, see it playing out, it really doesn't happen that way at all. The powers of the presidency, when this office was created, it was something brand new. Never, it, never had we seen something like this in a civilized society, this presidency. And the framers, like Alexander Hamilton, talked about energy defining this office. And energy is a perfect word because you see, if you pay attention to what really goes on, that it is the people and historical events that give meaning to the presidency. There are barely a thousand words in Article II that defines the powers of the presidency. And the framers anticipated that a lot of this would be filled out over time, starting with George Washington, they hoped, but that over time we would give meaning to these provisions. And so this is not something that just comes down on high and we have very clear-cut powers. To the contrary, you see these very colorful, strong-willed people walk onto the stage being elected presidents of the United States. And this book tries to capture how forces push and tug and buffet them around. And that is how meaning is given to the Constitution and the presidential powers. Why this book? Because it, it occurred to me that to be able to connect all of these dots together would be something we've never really seen before, that there are so many connections between and among presidencies that that's how you can learn from this. And so when I set out to do it, Michael, I specifically set out to have a chapter on each president. And some of the publishers said, you can't do that. Some of these presidents, William Henry Harrison in office for 30 days, you can't write a chapter about that. Well, those, it's a great chapter, actually. It's one of my favorites. Those publishers were the ones that I rejected. I wanted to have a book that had every president in it. And I am not so presumptuous as to think that I could master all 44 presidents, and that's why I got great authors. Gary Hart, for instance, many of you remember, ran for president, had studied President Monroe and written a book about him. He did the Monroe chapter. These are three of my fabulous chapters. I got, I mean, my fabulous authors. I got political scientists, historians, legal scholars, people who, who specialized in this. The biggest challenge in writing this book was to, well, first of all, dealing with this many authors who are all at the top of their game is a little bit of a challenge. And I admit, I rewrote and edited most of these chapters about 10 times each. They were very patient with me. But the whole idea was to get the aerial view of how you connect together the threads that bring together the different presidencies, the different eras in American history. And for me, actually, 
I would say the biggest challenge was not just doing all of the editing, to, because I wanted it to read like a seamless story, not like a disjointed collection of essays. And I hope you will find that that is the case. But one of the hardest things for me was writing the concluding chapter, because this was an effort to take all 44 presidents and bring some sense to it, themes that cross across presidencies, recurrent issues, uh, and that, uh, I'll tell you, I just hold myself up in my office at home and worked on this for months to try to pull it together. And for me, that was the greatest part of this because you do see in the end, and I think this book is proof positive, that none of this makes sense without historical context, that you cannot understand presidential power or the presidencies of the United States without understanding the events that propelled them into action and the people who moved them. And that is how we learn so much. And I think we will be able to learn going forward in this election in 2016. And going forward, you learn a lot from putting together those dots. Well, thank you, Ken. Um, and of course, then the question is, where do you begin a book like this? Um, when I was uh, in Philadelphia not too long ago, I had the privilege and honor of being able to see Justice Scalia in one of his last public appearances. And in that appearance, Justice Scalia said, in response to the question, who among all the different people might you most respect um, in the world of constitutional law, particularly with regard to the founding, his answer was the indispensable man, George Washington. So Judge Starr, tell us a little bit about George Washington in, uh, insofar as he is in this book. Let me join in saying thank you. This is such a wonderful and precious treasure here at the National Constitution Center. So Jeff, thank you for your uh, exemplary uh, and energetic uh, leadership, uh, which I think is what we see in General Washington. Let me pick up on what Ken just said about the context driving the milieu and the circumstances in which the president is going to operate. And Washington was extremely sensitive to the fear of executive power. We just come through a revolution after all. And so throughout the populous country was a great trust in legislative bodies and great distrust of executive power. And when we see, and I want to share two quick stories. The first is the frustration that some of the cabinet had in General Washington withholding the veto pen. He wielded that pen all of twice in eight years. If the great man were here, and we could say, General, were there more bills that came to your desk, first in New York and then here in Philadelphia, that you would have liked to have vetoed? He, I'm sure, would say yes. Many bills he did not agree with. But he had the sense of self-restraint at that particular time. Not weakness, but a sense of, let's allow the evolution of the of the process and not have, as it were, executive energy exercised in such a way that the people will say, no, no, wait a second, have we, have we created two, have we created a monarch? And of course, that was part of the conversation with the inefficiency of separation of powers. Maybe we really need energy in the executive, that unified executive known as a monarch. The second story has to do with the, the general's common sense, and the inchoate nature of the constitutional experience. Ken Gormley, and thank you for doing this prodigious labor of love. It's a great, great contribution. He noted that there were only 1,000 words in Article 2, and the lack of enumeration of powers, in contrast to Article 1, is quite revealing. And we all know that as students, avocation, or otherwise, of the Constitution great detail with respect to Article One, including a lot of thou shalt not, Congress, do the following. You have these powers, et cetera. But so much was left undefined, and one of the undefined clauses was the advice and consent clause. Well, what does that mean to go to the Senate with respect to a Supreme Court appointment, or in this instance, a treaty? Well, one day in New York, General Washington showed up. He had a treaty, and he said, in effect, this is a wonderful chapter, by the way, that, well, it would just be tedious. He used that word, tedious, to try to put something in writing, 
So he was an efficiency guy. He was a good military man. So I'm, he shows up, and apparently the Senate was not entirely ready for the great man to show up. <laughs> <laughs> and he presented, here were the 15 points in this proposed treaty that the vice president, John Adams, presiding over the world's greatest deliberative body, then proceeds to read. The problem is no one could hear Mr. Adams. There was so much noise pouring in from the street. The senators didn't know what was up. They said, play it again, Sam. So he read it again, met with stony silence. They didn't quite know what to do. And so questions started being asked and so forth. And the general is, is sitting there waiting for all of this to unfold. He wanted their consent. Well, he didn't get it. And he was quite dismayed by that and sort of thundered a, a bit and saying, my word, we need to get this show on the road and so forth. So he went away, but you know, the, the, the general had a fiery temper and part of his struggle in life was to control that temper. <laughs> and so he goes out in a bit of a huff, but cooler heads prevailed. He came back in a couple of days again in person and the treaty with the Native American tribe, the Creek Nation, was in fact approved by the United States Senate. Since that time, no president has shown up in the Senate <laughs> to seek the consent of the Senate. And so there, there it was. He was simply doing uh, what an efficient, good military man would do. Let's get this uh, show on the road and get it concluded. And it just points out again just the richness of the experience and how the experience of the presidents ends up giving meaning to the Constitution. And of course, a book on presidents and the Constitution must include one of the few presidents that might be said to be on the same parallel as George Washington. Not many can claim to be as great. Uh, one that oftentimes is listed among the greats is Abraham Lincoln, uh, Barbara Perry, who joins us from the Miller Center of Virginia. Tell us a little bit about Abraham Lincoln. Well, thank you, first of all, to the Constitution Center and to Jeff for having us here today and to our great leader, uh, mm -hmm. Ken Gormley, for producing this tome. It even has one of those red ribbon markers in it that makes it <laughs> feel <laughs> biblical. Um, but who could think of a better book to have as we come to this uh, amazing presidential election that we are facing in November? So I highly recommend it uh, to all of you. Um, my friend and colleague, Bill Peterson, wrote this chapter on Lincoln. Uh, he's at MSU Shreveport. Um, but I have a soft spot in my heart for Abraham Lincoln. I think it's because I'm a Kentuckian by birth. And so the very first presidential birthplace I ever went to was Hodgenville, Kentucky, near our home in Louisville. Uh, and Lincoln oftentimes will even uh, outshine on lists of great presidents. He'll sometimes sneak up into the number one position uh, over uh, General George Washington, President George Washington. Well, why is that? Uh, so as uh, Bill Peterson points out uh, so carefully and clearly in this chapter, uh, you have the fact that Abraham Lincoln uh, in the Civil War uh, read so much into the Constitution, particularly in the Commander-in-Chief Clause, uh, he broadened that to cover just about anything that he felt was necessary uh, to undertake during the Civil War. Uh, obviously, that was an unprecedented situation that, that happened on his watch. Uh, he was uh, convinced that it was better to read more into the Constitution and expand the power of the president uh, and perhaps even on occasion violate the Constitution if that served the cause of the Union to win the war. Because his thought was, if the Union loses the war, we will lose the Constitution. So obviously, it's important uh, to save that and to save the Union. Well, what are some examples, then, of his use of this uh, commander-in-chief power during the war? Uh, very famously, then, he expanded that to uh, form a blockade uh, around the uh, southern ports to try to uh, make sure that uh, necessities as well as uh, war material would not come into the southern ports. Uh, in the end, the Supreme Court, uh, particularly after he had named several members of the court, supported that uh, action in the prize cases. Uh, he also famously or infamously, if depending on one's view at that time, suspended the writ of habeas corpus, uh, a, a genuine right that we, we hold in this country uh, to know why we are placed in prison, if we should ever have that befall us. Uh, he suspended that, even though that power was not granted to the president, but rather to the Congress. 
Uh, he also used military tribunals. Obviously, this came back as an issue with the uh, Guantanamo Bay uh, prisoners during this war on terror. Uh, but he decided that military tribunals would be uh, in terms of um, trying uh, Confederates. Uh, he also uh, promulgated the Emancipation Proclamation under the Commander-in-Chief power. Uh, he made the case that during a time of war that the President would have the power to emancipate the slaves because they were still technically property. Uh, remember that the Dred Scott decision of 1857 had not granted citizenship uh, to slaves, and so uh, while Lincoln might have wanted to view them as citizens, they were not under the law at that time uh, viewed uh, in that way. They were viewed as property. This was sort of an instrumental approach that he used. And so uh, in those uh, states that were still under Confederate control, the Emancipation Proclamation freed those slaves. He felt he had the power to do that in time of war, again, seizing property from the enemy. Uh, this also served a dual purpose for him in the war effort because those emancipated slaves could then serve in the Union Army. So that was obviously important to the war effort. Uh, Lincoln also enlisted um, one of the most renowned uh, political scientists of the era, a man named Francis Lieber, uh, to draft what were called General Orders Number 100. Uh, they're sometimes known as the, the Lieber Code or Lincoln's Code. This was the first effort, the first attempt ever made in history to articulate a set of rules uh, to govern the rules of war and how war was to be conducted. Uh, so for example, the Lincoln Code banned the use of poison. It banned the use of torture and other practices that previously had been used uh, in wartime throughout the ages by military leaders. And the code in part was designed to try to protect these freed slaves who were joining the Union uh, or those who had been free and joined the Union from the North, joined the Union Army, uh, because there were instances where if they would be taken by and captured by the Confederates, they would be shot on sight or they would be tortured. Uh, so this is another one of the, the gifts, that you will, this code of um, military war, of use of, of military force that has been handed down to us in the rules of law by Abraham Lincoln. These then formed um, part of the Hague Conventions and then even to us the, the more famous uh, Geneva Conventions of the 20th century uh, to apply to wartime. So I, I think that Bill Peterson is so correct in, in ending his chapter in the book on Lincoln to say particularly with the poetic Gettysburg Address, so both in style and substance, that Lincoln really for the first time in our country's history combined the Declaration of Independence with the U.S. Constitution and that we view that, but those bound documents today uh, as governing us and that they were not only bound in this country but used throughout the world. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. And of course, there's so much uh, that's rich and interesting in this book. Um, we're going to not be able to spend as much time in the 19th century as we would like. Um, it may seem um, that we're talking about only giants or among uh, presidents that are considered to be great. It's my task to remind us a little bit about the 19th century and other presidents who perhaps time has to some extent forgotten and whom we might think have, uh, had relatively uneventful presidencies when it comes to constitutional law. It's my job in part to say that that's not the case. Um, now, I won't talk about some of the lesser known presidents like Harrison or Taylor, whose presidencies are rich in activity, uh, perhaps surprisingly, but I want to talk about Franklin Pierce, a president who oftentimes may be rated among the worst in American history, which is a distinction, I suppose, that none of them yearns for. Um, but Pierce, who served for four years, had an interesting, and one might even say tragic, presidency. Um, in this four, and this is a chapter that Paul Finkelman, my law school colleague, also uh, wrote and is an expert in this field. But among the things that makes the Pierce presidency interesting is the fact that uh, it's the only presidency in American history where over the course of four years there was not a single change in the cabinet. You might think that Pierce was a weak president, um, but it turns out he did some things that were not so weak, um, and we're going to talk about that now in a second, because Pierce uh, began his presidency in a remarkably tragic way, I mean, the worst possible tragedy in fact, that could possibly befall somebody. On the way to Washington for the inauguration, his train derails and he literally sees his son killed before him. Um, so if you, any, if you 
wonder if it's affected him. Just read the inaugural address he gives. It's when in the second or third sentence he talks about it. But it also destroyed his wife, and it sent Pierce to church. And he refused to do business over the weekend except once. There was a contingent sent to him from Congress, including Stephen Douglas. And one of the people that uh, Pierce paid closest attention to and sought advice from all the time, um, his Secretary of War, uh, Jefferson Davis. And they came to him with a bill because what they wanted to do was to change the way slavery was regulated in the territories. And this bill became known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And they asked uh, Pierce to consider it. And in fact, Davis even asked him to write it out in hand to ensure that it was what they wanted. Pierce did that reluctantly, but he did it. This law then changed the way slavery was going to be dealt with in the, in the territory so that it became a function of what became known as popular sovereignty. These new territories, these new states coming into the Union would in fact decide it according to what the majority, so to speak, in each of those different realms wanted. Well, in Kansas, it didn't work out quite so well. And what happened in Kansas, to make a long story short, is there was a civil war. Uh, one part of Kansas didn't want slavery. Others were coming into Kansas. They wanted to oppose slavery. And it became a challenge for Pierce as president to figure out which side am I going to be on. There never was a doubt. Pierce came down strongly on the side of slavery. Ended up not just trying to put in a government more than once into Kansas, but he ended up sending, he ended up using a lot of the force of the federal government. All the powers that he had available, he used to shove slavery down the throat of the people of Kansas. And that, and it was met with violence, and so he used force to try and settle that violence, and this became a hallmark of his presidency. It showed the real problems with popular sovereignty, and at the same time, it, uh, it ended its presidency in an enormously tragic way because it showed that maybe the impossibility of trying to solve this problem of slavery um, through the small-D democratic process. And certainly a process in which the president was so clearly on the side of one force, even uh, counterman countermanding what the popular people vote was. I, I should tell you one way it ends is that the, um, one of the governments that was formed in Kansas decides they dislike Pierce so much that when they name the streets in uh, Topeka as you run out towards Lawrence, Kansas, they're named for every president of the Union in the end of the period except for one. <laughs> No Pierce Street. It's actually named after Henry Clay. Interesting enough, um, uh, the, one, the one way in which Clay has tried to align with presidency. Um, so that takes us to the 19th century. There's much to be said about other presidents um, in that period, but we're going to come to the 20th century. And Barbara, one of the chapters you wrote on President Kennedy to give us a flavor now in the modern era about uh, what's happening with the presidency, particularly just uh, President Kennedy. Absolutely. So I mentioned that I had a soft spot in my heart for Abraham Lincoln, but in, in the period of time that I, th I think when I was about six or seven that my parents took us to Hodgenville, uh, they were very bipartisan and almost, uh, I think, knowing that I would grow up to be a presidency scholar. So when I was four, <laughs> my, my mother took us to see John F. Kennedy, who was campaigning one month before the election in, in our hometown of Louisville. And until she passed on, she would say, don't you remember? We, we got there early and we stood right in front of the podium. I'd say, mother, I was four. I can remember <laughs> the balloons and the confetti, but I can't, I can't quite remember what the future future president said. And then uh, a couple years later, um, <laughs> former President Eisenhower came through town and they took us out to the airport to see him as well. So uh, they, they really uh, got us interested in, in this topic to be sure. So uh, Kennedy is, is a lifelong interest and passion of mine. And I think one of the reasons I used to think to myself, why did mother pack three kids, including myself as a four-year-old, into the car and get there early and stand in a big crowd of people uh, to see this man? And uh, I think part of it was that he was her age. You know, he was her generation, the, the, the so-called greatest generation. Uh, she would like to point out that actually he was three years older, but uh, <laughs> they were in the same generation. And we're Catholic, and of course he was the, uh, to this day, the, the first uh, and only Catholic to be elected president of the United States. So in my chapter, I focus on two areas of, of constitutionalism and, and the law, and that is religion and race. Uh, which played such important roles uh, in the Kennedy era uh, and obviously in today's era. 
So for Kennedy, uh, the, his Catholicism was really used against him uh, over and over again uh, as he ran for president. Um, I used to think in reading the, the very beautifully written uh, by Ted Sorensen's speech that he gave in September of 1960 to the Protestant ministers in Houston uh, to make the case that uh, he should be president despite his religion, but he should be made president uh, or should not be voted against, I should say, because he wanted to make the case that he was a separationist. That is, that he saw uh, clearly, the, in, in constitutional terms, the Jeffersonian concept of the wall of separation between church and state. And the way he made that case was in a personal way, uh, that he made it by saying that his Catholicism, his beliefs were purely private, and they would not have an impact on uh, public policy or on his actions as president. And he, he made very, I think, very moving, poignant statements uh, at that time where he said, um, you may have known, of course, that his brother Joe Jr. was killed in World War II, 1944, on a very dangerous mission. Uh, a plane exploded over the coast of England. And Kennedy said, you know, nobody asked my brother what his religion was before he climbed in that plane. And, and nobody asked me before I volunteered for combat service in the South Pacific uh, in World War II. Uh, and so he infused this Jeffersonian theory into that speech, uh, helped by his wordsmith, Ted Sorensen, who was a Unitarian, by the way. So he was very steeped in Jeffersonian principles. Um, but it, nevertheless, the, all the reading that I've done shows that uh, Catholicism still had a, 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 there was strong bias against it and still uh, hurt Kennedy in, in the long run. Uh, but it, he was able to overcome it. He got 83% of the Catholic vote and about a third of the Protestant vote uh, to defeat Richard Nixon in 1960. But he was always aware of the fact that people could accuse him of using his religion in making public policy decisions. So during his presidency, when the Congress took up uh, uh, education funding uh, for schools, uh, Kennedy would never support uh, federal funding for church-run or Catholic schools or parochial schools. And this was much to the upset of the Catholic hierarchy, particularly uh, Francis Cardinal Spellman uh, in New York was very much upset with Kennedy over that. Another thing that Kennedy did in the religion area was as soon as the Supreme Court handed down in 1962 the Engel versus Vitale case, which banned state-drafted mandatory prayer in the public schools, uh, Kennedy in a press conference that week, was that was the first question that came to him from the press, was what do you think about that decision? It was rather a trap, I think he thought, and he said, well, uh, we, we must support the, the Supreme Court and its decisions even if we don't agree with them. Hmm. And then he added, he said, you know, the way to deal with this, if people are upset that prayer may be removed from the public schools, the way we deal with this is to pray on our own, in our homes, with our families. So that's one of the elements that I address in the chapter. I then, though, relate that somewhat indirectly, to be sure, but relate it nevertheless to race. When Pre President Kennedy, before he was president, Senator Kennedy running for the presidency in 1960 with Brother Bobby as his campaign manager, they were so aware of the bias against Roman Catholicism uh, in many parts of the country, but particularly in the Bible Belt South, that they feared that if they came out strongly in the campaign for civil rights or for equality of the races or for uh, desegregation of public facilities or businesses, uh, that that would be the second strike against them in the South. So they already knew they had probably one strike against them, the, the candidate's religion, but they worried about race uh, as being another. So they really backed off of that discussion uh, in the campaign, though both the Republican and the Democratic platforms that year talked about the rights of man and the importance of equality between the races. Uh, so Kennedy backed off on that. Uh, he also was very much vexed, he and his brother were, by the Freedom Rides and the Freedom Riders who were met with violence uh, as they tried to desegregate the interstate buses uh, in the South. They were met with violence in Mississippi and Alabama. And uh, the, the president tried to remove himself from that. Bobby tried to remove the president from it. They tried to tell the leaders of the movement, please back off of this. You're only stirring up trouble. But then as the years went by in this truncated presidency and the president had to send in federal troops to integrate the University of Mississippi campus in the summer of 1962 where there was violence with town and gown. Uh, two journalists shot to death uh, uh, in this process. Uh, as the president saw the police dogs and the water cannons being turned on the peaceful uh, 
black protesters, young people particularly in the streets of Birmingham in the summer of 1963. And then as it became clear that he was going to have to send in, uh, probably in this case, uh, nationalize the, the, um, the guard, uh, in Alabama to integrate the University of Alabama in June of 1963, the president turned. He turned his, his, his vision of race and the need for equality between the races. Uh, he went on television uh, the night of June the 11th, uh, gave a speech, a very heartfelt, dramatic speech from the Oval Office about race and about the need for equality between the races. And he, he said for the first time that racial equality and civil rights were a moral issue. He had been pressed by civil rights leaders, particularly Martin Luther King, to label civil rights as a moral issue, but he didn't do so until that night. The speech was written so quickly by Ted Sorensen with this famous line that says, President Kennedy says that the uh, that civil rights and equality are there. There is uh, that that issue as a moral issue is as old as the scripture. He said, and it, it is as clear as the American Constitution. But the speech was written so quickly and such in haste that Ted Sorensen didn't have time to produce a conclusion. So I urge you to go on uh, the Miller Center website where we have a whole speech archive. You just go to millercenter.org. We have a whole speech archive, including that speech. You can go on YouTube and watch it. It's a short speech, but you'll see the president as he comes towards the end of this speech, that he looks up right into the camera, he has no more text, he's run out of text, and so he ad-libs the last five minutes of the speech, which is truly amazing. But in that speech, he says, it is now time to send to the Congress a comprehensive civil rights bill, and it will be a bill that will be to integrate public facilities, theaters, uh, restaurants, hotels, motels, throughout the South, throughout the country, because this is the right thing to do. And he says, if you don't think it's the right to, thing to do and you're white, how many of you, he says, how many of you Americans would change the color of your skin and go and live as a black person or a Negro was the term that he used. Um, so for the first time then in his administration, he sends up to Capitol Hill a comprehensive civil rights bill. He didn't do that politically before 1963 because he said the Southern Democrats though they're of my party, the Southern Democrats are primarily segregationists. They are the most senior members of the House and Senate. They will block that bill, and they will block the rest of my new frontier agenda. And he wasn't willing to take that risk. And so he sadly dies, as we know, November 22nd, 1963, riding through the streets of Dallas. He's assassinated. He does not see that bill to the end in Congress. It remains for us to discuss whether it would have passed had he not been killed. Killed. But instead, Lyndon Johnson, the new president, ironically a Texan, in the few days after the president's assassination, Lyndon Johnson goes before the Congress assembled and he says nothing would honor our fallen president more than passage of the Civil Rights Bill for which he fought so long and hard. Thank you, Barbara. And of course, th this is also, it's a reminder of a lot of things, but one of them is a reminder that even though a presidency may be short, it may be eventful. It may have tremendous impact. It's a reminder that to some extent, uh, the occupant, even though he, he or she may be there for a short while, can affect the office, and the office can affect the occupant as well. Um, Judge Starr, in your distinguished career, you've met, more, uh, you've met a few presidents. Mm -hmm. And you write about a two-term president whom you knew, Ronald Reagan. Tell us about President Reagan. Historical circumstances, there was a perception of American weakness. The economy was viewed as being very, very, very difficult. Uh, but even more so, there was a parlous state in terms of national security symbolized by the seemingly eternal I Iranian hostage crisis. And the aborted attempt to rescue the hostages just seemed to symbolize um, failure, presidential failure. And the uh, uh, upshot was uh, Reagan was quite naturally, while a very congenial, optimistic, sunny disposition kind of person, quite firm and quite decisive. And so two episodes to uh, reflect that. He was supported during the 1980 uh, campaign by the uh, Air Controllers Union or organization called PATCO. So how ironic that when Patco, early on in his uh, tenure, threatened to go out on strike, uh, he made it very clear that if the 
controllers went out on strike, uh, they would be forfeiting their jobs. He didn't say, we'll fire you, but you will be leaving your jobs if, if you do that. And uh, for whatever reason, PATCO miscalculated uh, and went out on strike, and they were given 48 hours to return. They did not, and so uh, Reagan was just absolutely firm, and that was simply the way he was. This was, to him, a matter of principle. The law was very clear. Federal law made it absolutely clear that federal governmental employees, quite apart from the vital, uh, invaluable role played by uh, air controllers, could not strike. You might not like that law, but it's the law of the land. And he did have this sense, I'm going to enforce the law. And so uh, he did. That was episode number one. Episode number two, which was unfolding at the same time, reflected an ongoing constitutional conversation of several decades length. The device in question was called legislative veto. There's no provision in the Constitution for the legislature to veto. There's a provision for the president to enjoy that power. But over time, folks from both parties and a number of political scientists said, in effect, to assert greater democratic, with a small d, control over the bureaucracy we need to have a measure or device, a legislative veto, so that if an agency issues regulations or otherwise makes a decision, that decision should come before us and we can overturn that decision either by a one-house veto or a two-house veto. The delicate situation was that, of course, bypassed the president and under the constitutional structure, in order to become law, a measure had to not only pass both houses, but to be presented to, to the president who has a certain period of time to consider and to act on that proposed legislation, the so-called presentment clause. Interestingly enough, because of his concerns about limited government, the growth of government that was a part of the leitmotif of the campaign and really part of his DNA, he believed in the if I may call this, the, the Catholic uh, ideal of subsidiarity. He had this sunny, optimistic view, but just let the people make their own decisions. So he loved the idea of the federal republic. He had been governor, of course, of a state, had great confidence in the localities and so forth to do the right thing and to have the, the conversation and to come to what the policy objective uh, would be. And he embraced legislative veto. He thought about it, and he embraced it, and it was actually put into the Republican platform. Now, it wasn't a key provision of the platform, but there it is, that we need to control the bureaucracy. He comes into office, and the Office of Legal Counsel, headed by Ted Olson, does an analysis, and not surprisingly, comes to the view that the legislative veto device is unconstitutional. The Attorney General of the United States, so the Chief Law Enforcement and Legal Officer, reviews the situation. I was counselor to the Attorney General, and we all agreed. It may make common sense, it may be a very practical device, maybe very efficacious, but it's not a constitutional structure. In one meeting, when he looked at the documents and heard the Attorney General, President Reagan said, you're right, we've been wrong. And so at that point, the executive branch switched its position, or now took the position in litigation, that the legislative veto device was unconstitutional. And in the fullness of time, in a case called Immigration Naturalization Service versus Chada, the Supreme Court, by a supermajority, it was a six to three opinion, uh, agreed with the executive branch's decision that our separation of powers structural regime embodied in the Constitution, required a presentment to the president and not bypassing or uh, doing an end run around the presidency. I was so impressed by that. May I mention one other thing that didn't quite make it into the book, if I've got just one Sorry, more. Sorry, Ken, we couldn't get everything in there. <laughs> we, ha we had, the, uh, he is a brilliant and wonderful person, but he is a, an editorial assassin. <laughs> But a gentle assassin. <laughs> so, Sandra Day O'Connor, that appointment, mm -hmm. when we analyzed the situation, we being in the Justice Department, 
there were, to be honest, not a, there was not a large, as it were, bench of women to draw from at that time. This was 1980. This occurred, the vacancy of Potter Stewart occurred in the very early months of the Reagan presidency. So we parsed, we in the Justice Department, parsed what the president had said as candidate Reagan. And we said, well, we think you essentially, Mr. President, made a best efforts. But we have these renowned folks who are so eminently qualified to go on the Supreme Court. And I'll always remember this. I wasn't present because the Attorney General was, he said, I made a pledge to the American people. He didn't play with the words. The person has to be qualified, but perhaps the person hasn't had all the experiences at someone else, but it is time for a woman to go on the Supreme Court. I made that, I made that promise. Well, Mr. President, it wasn't a promise. In my view, it was a promise. So it was, I'm a man of my word, and this is very important for the, for the country. So what is the principle to be drawn from that? What are the principles that are animating the president. What is causing him, or perhaps soon her, to really think through how is it that I'm going to make this decision? What is this policy going to be? It can't simply be the opinion poll say X. It has to also be something that's grounded in, in principle. And the principle may be one, as we said with Washington, that of prudence, of self-restraint, of care, of being mindful that I've got to know practical wisdom, which battles to fight, and then when to step back and say, this isn't the best resolution, but all things considered, I can accept it. It's called compromise. Thank you, Justara. That's really important to remember. Um, of course, presidents have, have numerous opportunities to both define principles and to engage with them, and sometimes to come into conflict with them. Um, and having set a precedent in which I don't always operate chronologically, I'm going to follow that now, because I want to consider a presidency that really sort of ends up engaging with principle in a remarkable way, perhaps an unexpected way, if you could return to the presidency of Gerald Ford mm. uh, in the Watergate era and the importance that uh, President Ford may have for this book. So, Ken? Yeah, well, Michael, for me, the Ford chapter is a great example of what I was trying to accomplish in this book. In fact, it was this story is one of the reasons I set out to write the book. You asked it first. Um, I wrote the biography of Archibald Cox, uh, the Watergate special prosecutor. Many of you are nodding your heads and are old enough to remember who he is and what Watergate was and who what <laughs> President Nixon was. Um, I will never forget interviewing President Ford for that book in a hotel in New York. And, he, uh, and I asked him about the pardon. He pulled out his wallet and a little scrap of paper and showed me the citation to this case, Burdick versus New York, that I'd never heard of, and I taught constitutional law, and he said this case stood for the proposition that acceptance of a pardon was an admission of guilt. I thought I got from President Nixon what the country wanted. And I thought, wow, this is interesting. So in the book, in the Woodrow Wilson chapter, Burdick makes a cameo appearance <laughs> because Burdick was a, an editor of a New York newspaper. He was being called in front of a grand jury, and President Wilson, he, to, to give some information, uh, which he refused to do, and Wilson thought he'd outsmart him by giving him a pardon in advance. He had a pardon waiting for him. So how can you take the Fifth Amendment if you've already been pardoned for any crimes? Well, Burdick said, I don't want to take the pardon, it makes me look guilty. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court agreed and said, a pardon is an imputation of guilt, acceptance of a pardon is an admission of guilt. President Ford sent a young lawyer named Benton Becker, when he was thinking about the pardon, to go research how broad the powers and the implications of the pardon. And Benton Becker found that case, brought it back to the White House, and President Ford, in this little-known story, sends Benton Becker, this young 30-year-old lawyer, no one knew who he was, out to San Clemente with President Nixon's lawyer, Herbert Jack Miller, to, try, to tell him, basically give him his Miranda rights and tell him if he accepts the pardon, it was an illegal admission of guilt. They wanted that explicit. They also were trying to get Nixon to sign a deed of gift for his records and tapes, which were key evidence in the Watergate trials that would 
go forward, and they feared if they sent them out as Nixon wanted, they'd go up in a big bonfire in California, and I think they were correct about that, incidentally. So Benton Becker goes <laughs> and tells Nixon in a private meeting that, that about this Burdick case from the uh, Wilson administration, and I did a program at Duquesne University some years later because I became fascinated by this, and Benton Becker and, and uh, Jack Miller were both there. They're now unfortunately deceased, but they both acknowledged that not only did this take place, but Jack Miller for the first time admitted with the permission of the Nixon family that Nixon tried to not accept the pardon at first because he didn't want any admission of guilt. But they got it accomplished, they got the deed of gift, which is why we have Nixon's papers, and we now have all presidential papers preserved subsequently because of what Congress did. But President Ford always felt so frustrated that the American public didn't understand this piece. And in fact, when I did that program, I can tell you, I went to work the next day, it was broadcast on C-SPAN, thank you C-SPAN, <laughs> nationwide. I got a call, I was at work, and my secretary said, there's a guy who says it's President Ford on the phone, should I hang up? <laughs> and I said, well, put it through, we'll see. And it was President Ford thanking me for doing this because he just felt, as he said, it was the right thing for the country. And a few years before he died, the J John F. Kennedy Library gave him the Profiles and Courage Award for making that decision. Mm -hmm. And he told me that was one of the most meaningful things for him because finally people understood what he was doing. So to me, the, you know, Jeffrey Crouch wrote this excellent chapter on President Ford, but it ties together these historical threads and you see without what happened in the Burdick case in 1915, this history would never have been made, and it is those connections that I think is the richest part of being able to look at presidents in this way. Thank you, Ken. I, I will take a quick moment as a moderator, personal privilege here, to say I, uh, when I came to Washington for practice of law, I practiced with Herbert Jack Janelli mm -hmm. uh, great at his guy. law firm, yeah. and he, I remember the story that was told um, uh, by a young lawyer in that firm who then was, had become, later become a partner and um, Jack was such a consummate Washington practitioner, such a tremendous lawyer, tremendous discretion and skill. He comes to this young lawyer and says, by the way, I'm gonna be out of town this weekend, would you house sit for me? The young lawyer says, yes, sure, you know, because the young lawyer wants to progress in the firm. Uh, so he comes <laughs> to the house, Jack's away, and then the phone starts ringing off the hook. And the young lawyer's answering the phone saying yes, and they're asking about some pardon of of Richard Nixon, and the young lawyer is able to say quite truthfully, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> exactly as Jack planned it. <laughs> um, and of course, um, talking of plans, things don't always work out so great. Um, and sometimes they do in very unexpected ways, which will bring us to the chapter on President Clinton, which you also wrote, Ken. Well, I wrote a book called The Death of American Virtue, Clinton versus Starr, about all of these episodes. It's a very good book, un <laughs> un unfortunately. <laughs> well, I always say this is a story you could not invent in your wildest <laughs> imagination if you were trying to write some crazy fiction. President Clinton obviously was the first baby boomer. He does come into office, and you know there were honest opinions on both sides about this whole thing, but he came into office with a number of people thinking he was an unworthy president. And he is just beset by all of these scandals. We start with the Whitewater uh, scandal back in Arkansas, and that's the basis for independent counsel Ken Starr being appointed. But it then turns into the, the Vince Foster suicide, the Paula Jones sexual harassment case, and people start connecting dots that don't necessarily connect. And then we have the Monica Lewinsky affair that leads to the second uh, impeachment trial in American history. Uh, so all of that is in the book, um, but the chapter, I end the chapter, and this is the part that I just wanted to share uh, with you today, with the fact that you learn also how a, a president's legacy is determined after he or she leaves office, as with Jimmy Carter, but Bill Clinton, when you think about it, in many ways is more popular in the period after he leaves office, almost as an you know, an example, an international figure of American determination and resilience. He survives this impeachment trial still standing and, and strong. 
and uh, goes on to do uh, great things after he is president. And interestingly, the House managers who pushed the impeachment thing uh, end up looking more the ones who are petty and, uh, and, and out of kilter a little bit. So you learn from this, first of all, you can't tell the bucking bronco of history where to ride. It's going to go, and the House <laughs> managers who thought they would define his legacy did not succeed. But secondly, his wife, Hillary Clinton, is the first first lady, first former first lady in American history who has become a world-renowned public official in her own right as you know, U.S. Senator from New York, Secretary of State, now candidate for president. Uh, obviously, Eleanor Roosevelt had an appointment uh, as a representative of the UN, but Hillary Clinton is the first. And so we, we see increasingly, and I think it's fascinating, that it's not only what the president does after he or she leaves office, but what a president's spouse does is going to increasingly define their legacy. And so I, I was uh, saying to just earlier today that the lesson you take from that is, first of all, uh, if you plan on becoming president, stay healthy, because the longer you live, the more <laughs> people forget the bad stuff that may have happened. <laughs> and secondly, marry well, because if your spouse ends up being president of the United States, that can be very good for you. <laughs> oh, and incidentally, Ken, obviously this chapter has a lot to do with the investigations, uh, some of which were headed by you as independent counsel, but did you want to say a word about this chapter? Well, it's sad that the chapter is so, uh, shall I say, rooted in, in the unpleasantness, uh, as I used to call it, the recent unpleasantness, <laughs> that it was so tragic for the country. And what I'm reminded when I read the chapter uh, is of David Marinus's wonderful book, uh, First in His Class. David Marinus, a reporter at the time for the Washington Post. Uh, and uh, uh, President Clinton was, uh, and perhaps still is, uh, the most gifted politician of the baby boomer generation. He's just in remarkable gifts. His genuine empathy. I spent a lot of time in the great state of Arkansas. And leave aside the unpleasantness, uh, his genuine empathy for human beings uh, is absolutely clear. It is powerful. It is palpable. And the folks of Arkansas really understood that about him, that he genuinely cared. The I feel your pain is, is absolutely genuine. So in a way, it also reminds me of the book, uh, looking back on LBJ's uh, presidency, entitled The Tragedy of Lyndon Johnson, because what could have been, uh, and so there are certain tragic dimensions of it which we all uh, lament. Uh, now, that having been said, I th think this idea of this redemptive process afterwards, we have certainly seen that powerfully with both, I think, President Carter and, uh, and, and, and President Clinton. Uh, in contrast, uh, President uh, Ford, I think, was viewed, and perhaps this is unfair, as really just having a very pleasant retirement. But what was he doing that was really impacting a hurting world and promoting human flourishing and so forth? He may have done many things, but President Carter, I think, set a very high standard, which uh, President Clinton clearly continues to follow. Well, this has been a really uh, a great discussion, perhaps a discussion, Ken, I wish we had had before you asked me to write the Barack Obama chapter, <laughs> um, because it's not over. Um, uh, so trying to write a chapter about President Obama during the course of his presidency, before it's over, was, of course, my um, charge, and I appreciate being given that opportunity. Um, it was an interesting and unending experience, because every time <laughs> we would have something we would want to write about, it just wouldn't stay put. Um, <laughs> and then there would be something else new or different that went on. Um, so uh, you'll get a chapter on President Obama. Um, it is um, a work in progress, so to speak, but we tried <laughs> to identify a number of different things that were, of course, uh, important constitutionally in his presidency. Some of these were uh, uh, predictable, and perhaps some of them were not. On the predictable side, of course, we know the Affordable Care Act. Uh, 
a very significant piece of legislation. As a matter of policy, I think quite historic. But it also, of course, raised a number of different constitutional issues, some of which have gone to the United States Supreme Court and some of which are still going <laughs> to the United States Supreme Court. Um, among these are, uh, were the very critical issue about the extent to which the um, Congress, through a piece of legislation, could require people um, to purchase um, private health care insurance. How could that be? Well, the United States Supreme Court, in a very narrow decision, ended up helping the president by upholding what was called the individual mandate, not on the grounds I think everybody expected, which had to do with Congress's power to regulate inter interstate commerce, but instead through Congress's taxing power, which uh, is a very broad authority. And it was the authority that became the basis for penalizing people if they weren't going to purchase private health care insurance. So that was a very critical choice and moment for the Obama presidency. Of course, we know other areas in which the uh, president um, also, I think, it didn't necessarily break new ground, but broke surprising ground. Uh, one of the ones that, in fact, Ken and I kept working on had to do with drones. Mm. Uh, something that was revealed uh, that had occurred during President Obama's first term, but had been kept secret. Um, and the, the legal authority for using drones, drones in foreign countries, which might even be used in ways that resulted in the death of American citizens, raised very difficult issues under the law and the Constitution. The, under the Constitution, one of the critical questions is, to what extent could the president do that without explicit or express congressional authorization? Uh, president Obama, of course, maintained he had that authority, came up with uh, opinions from his own Office of Legal Counsel in the Justice Department, but the very heat that he had to go under, the public pressure that he was put under, put this back to some extent in Congress's court. And that's a critical and very interesting issue of constitutional law. Yet another one of the issues that comes up with President Obama is one that has been working its way into the courts. Uh, it has to do with his use of executive orders. He took executive actions on immigration, which raised interesting questions about the extent to which he could take executive actions um, in, uh, uh, in his, uh, under his own claim that he had the constitutional and legal basis for doing so that really created um, an interesting uh, program with respect to immigration. Uh, and the particular program in immigration had to do with amnesty and in a sense re recognizing some legal status for or immigrants who otherwise were here illegally uh, under United States law. Um, so the president, after issuing these executive orders, had them challenged in court. And of course, those uh, the legal challenges were both uh, ultimately upheld in Texas. And it worked its way to a United States Supreme Court, which is divided eight, uh, four to four on many issues right now. With eight justices, due to the tragic death of Justice Scalia, um, the court now confronts many major issues, one of which involves the president's authority, whether as a matter of administrative law or as a matter of constitutional authority, he could issue these orders. And that is the question that now is lingering before the Supreme Court. We don't know where it's gonna come, come out or we don't know whether it's gonna come back. Um, so that issue is now, of course, one that is uh, at least undecided in terms of our history and I guess uh, I can't, you can't blame me if I didn't talk about the ending of it in the book. Uh, <laughs> it will be in the paperback right, version right. when it comes <laughs> out. And when the paperback comes out, you'll know who have worked the hardest uh, with regard to that uh, chapter. Um, I look forward to that legacy <laughs> being shaped and written. Um, but with our little remaining time, I want to get to something else that I think would interest all, all of us. And that is the fact that, as we all know, we are in the midst of pre a presidential election. All of you have written about thought about the presidency, and I'm just kind of curious, we can go, start with Barbara and work our way across the, our, our distinguished panel and talk about the extent to which um, the work that you did in the book or elsewhere may be of interest to us to keep in mind as we experience the presidential election that's now unfolding before us. Well, uh, two areas. Uh, one already mentioned about first ladies. Uh, I have written on first ladies, including um, a book on Jacqueline Kennedy's first ladyship. And it is fascinating to think that we could have the possibility, presuming that Hillary Clinton uh, earns the nomination of her party, that we could have not only the first woman president, but the first first lady. 
uh, than to come back to the White House as a former First Lady, as President of the United States. Um, what I find more intriguing, um, perhaps as you all will understand, is the possibility of uh, Donald Trump's presidency. And the reason I find that intriguing as a political scientist who studies the Constitution and presidents is that I view him as the most recent, if he were to be president, the most recent unprecedented president we have had since George Washington. If you think about it, George Washington truly was an unprecedented president because he was our first president and we had never had a president under that new constitution. The thought that I would like to spin out and have you think about is that because Donald Trump has no political experience and no uh, service as a public official, and we can't know at this point where he stands on the Constitution, and that may be unknowable uh, all the way to the Oval Office, that it is, to say the least, intriguing to me, uh, if not somewhat frightening, to think that we could have, again, an unprecedented president. And I will leave it at that. Okay, Judge Stock? The transnational emergence of uh, almost radical populism deep anger, a sense of dislocation. Uh, our children are not going to do as well as we did or as our parents' generation. Uh, and we simply have not adjusted as a society to what seem to be these, the 1%, the 99% uh, folks making these massive amounts of money and then others struggling to make uh, ends meet the changing demographics of the nation rapidly changing. I think we are in a period of considerable instability and what deeply concerns me is, now to go back in time, President Johnson going to the Congress of the United States in a joint session. I just, I remember this so vividly. I don't remember the context, I just know that he said, come let us reason together. <laughs> Can we talk with one another? And so the utter decline and erosion of civility in, in discourse uh, has, I think, very troubling implications. As Gordon Gee, president of West Virginia University, said when he was chancellor at Vanderbilt University, that the world has become a shouting match and there are always places for shouts and strong feelings, but the genius of uh, American democracy and a presidential leadership is to bring unity out of our diversity, e pluribus unum, out of many one. And we don't seem to hear too many voices saying, let us find common ground. And back to our editor, Ken. Well, on that note, Ken, if you were to ask me what theme runs across the presidencies most dominantly, I would tragically have to reply, race from the beginning of the country until now. Um, and certainly President Barack Obama's presidency will be viewed as transformational because he is the first African American president. But I wanna say just recently in working on another side project, I interviewed some of President Obama's family members. You remember that his mother, Stanley Ann Dunham, uh, and his grandparents, Stanley and uh, Madeline Dunham were white. They grew up in Kansas. They later moved to Hawaii, and I have seen his birth certificate. It is there. <laughs> um, but his, his family was from Kansas. And stop and think what Michael told you earlier. Kansas is where bleeding Kansas mm. happened, where people poured in who favored ra uh, slavery and who opposed it and literally killed each other. And 160 years later, even with this is what produced Barack Obama, Kansas, and 160 years later, we're still fighting over it. We still have the issues in Baltimore and Ferguson, Missouri, and we're seeing it animated, rearing its head very much in this presidential election. We can only hope that that wisdom and energy that the framers hoped to put in this office of the presidency will eventually allow us to find our way out of that when we are a country that is premised on a notion of equal justice for all. We had better hope that. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Ken. I, and maybe you'll allow me to, to, take a, to identify a couple things, I think, that are themes of the book that also um, may be worth keeping in mind as we watch the presidential election unfold. Uh, the one is unpredictability. Uh, one thing that happens almost with every president, even with William Henry Harrison, uh, who was there for only 31 days, um, sometimes you can't predict the kinds of issues that have come before you, and you can't necessarily predict how you'll deal with them. Um, and so one thing to consider is, even though we're all focused on particular issues now, what's going to be the issue we don't see? What's going to be the issue that is a little bit less predictable, that the next president, whoever he or she may be, may have to deal with? That's going to be, the, in some ways, the measure of that presidency, the real challenge, to some extent, of that presidency. And the other thing I, I want to bring us back to is the, the theme about precedent, the extent to which uh, a president in office helps to both create and shape precedents that will influence what other presidents do. George Washington took into account, as, uh, as the book itself says, um, every, almost everything he did was going to create a precedent for some future presidents. And other presidents will all, uh, also understand that, uh, sometimes to acute degrees, the extent to which whatever he or she does is going to create precedents, but also will they be following precedents in the course of their presidency. So these are themes to think about as whoever takes the White House, uh, they'll in a sense be buffeted against these different themes. I wish we had more time. I know that we're gonna be around to sign books after this. Um, I wanna thank Ken for editing this extraordinary volume and one of the most distinguished panels for being president, president at this wonderful location. Please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you very much. Well done, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. What a joy. Thank you. Thank you, Mike.